How's it going? Andrew here, and welcome back to the Creative Endeavor Podcast, the podcast bringing you inspiring stories from artists from around the world. And in this episode, I'm talking to Steve Schmiller, who's an incredible surrealist artist based in Canada. Now, I've been following Steve for a little while, and like a lot of the artists that I have on this show, I found him through Instagram. I connected with Steve instantly. I just really admire and love his work. It's got this really exceptional quality where it's so well executed and well rendered, but it has this otherworldly appearance at the same time. And he explores all kinds of interesting themes within his paintings. Now, I wanted to ask Steve about his artistic process and get into the weeds a little bit with how he goes about developing a picture. And we even compared notes on how we go about approaching our art and our creative journeys. But I also wanted to hear a little bit about the business side of things as well and how he makes it as a professional artist. This was a great conversation and one that I think I'm going to keep coming back to. I got a heck of a lot out of it and I hope you will too. So without further ado, here's Steve Schmiller in The Creative Endeavor. Steve Schmiller, welcome to the Creative Endeavor podcast. It is an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Let's uh, kick things off here with maybe having you tell us about your work, about your story, maybe about your creative journey so far. Okay. Um, well, like I'm sure everyone else that uh, you've had on your podcast and any other serious artist out there, um, I started off drawing at a super young age. Um, you know, I'll kind of go quickly through that to get to the more uh, unique details about me. But um, just drew constantly as a kid. Um, loved to invent. A blank piece of paper was the most enjoyable place for me, regardless of where I was. Um, so I filled all of those as much as possible. Anything I could find, um, as kids do. And thankfully was never discouraged. My parents were pretty supportive, even though they, they weren't artists or anybody in my family necessarily. So um, I'm really grateful that they were supportive and understanding as much as they could be in terms of me wanting to go down that path. Um, growing up in northern Alberta and more of a kind of like a more of a like a blue collar working class kind of area. Um, then at the age of 13, I was drawing late one night, uh, listening to music. Uh, I was really into heavy metal music at the time, so um, it was my first love. And uh, I was I was right in the middle of drawing something. I think it was like a a barbarian character <laughs> with a sword, you know, like some muscle guy with a sword or something like that. And uh, and I was listening to this music, and it was like, in particular it was like this this band Megadeth, and I'm just globally huge everybody knows about them now and there was this one guitar lick i don't know why but just the way that it sounded i just like said to myself i want to play guitar and then i told my mom like the next day and she was all into it because she wanted to play music when she was young and never had the opportunity and so as soon as i said that she said okay sure we're you know she got me a electric guitar out of this year's catalog um, it was like a you know a low budget guitar, but it was good enough, like plenty high quality. And um, so I took to that as much as possible. Um, I've always been very like uh, set in my ways and focused. So uh, once I started playing guitar, that was it. And I still drew here and there, but I was one of those people that wanted to be as good as they could possibly be no matter what, even if I had to sacrifice everything else. So I practiced constantly as much as I could and did that for the next decade, really, from the age of like 13 or 14 into my 20s. Um, moved away from from my hometown, which is uh, Grand Prairie, Alberta, uh, which is like eight hours north of where I moved after that, which was Calgary. Um, five hours drive north of Edmonton, roughly, uh, moved down to Calgary with a close friend of mine and we pursued music and just, you know, got little part-time jobs here and there to, you know, help to pay the rent. Um, 
pursued music for a long time uh, and went through the ringer with that, really understood everything about um, doing something artistic as a career. And that was exactly the same now. Like so many of those experiences translate into art like perfectly. Um, so did that, lived in Calgary until 2007. Uh, I could go deeper into the music part of it for sure. But um, just to kind of give you a rough overview, went to the interior BC, tiny little town called Lumbee uh, after the band broke up on good terms, thankfully. Um, lived there for a year, started painting, lived in the middle of nowhere uh, for about a year uh, with a girl that I was uh, dating at the time. And then made my way to Victoria, BC, uh, 2008, um, and just painted there. Um, eventually got a job teaching guitar lessons a couple days a week as well. Um, and then got gigs in local pubs and eventually had a house gig at a pretty nice like pub slash restaurant right on the water. Um, did that for a year. So for the most part, I was playing music uh, like two or three nights a week and then painting constantly when I wasn't playing music. Um, and then moved to Toronto in 2012 with my uh, partner who's who we're still together um, and she's in theater so we both moved to the largest city in the country of course because you know that's what you do right um, and she pursued her thing there I pursued my thing so it was about six years that we lived in Toronto together learned a lot from that experience and then moved back as we'd planned to do we never planned to move there permanently so uh, just moved back about a year ago just over a year ago and now I live in Sydney BC, which is also in Vancouver Island. It's like uh, 35 minutes north of Victoria. Um, and that's where I'm at currently. So that's the rough timeline. That's quite, that's quite a story. It's quite a path that you've traveled. So when did the, when did the art start happening? What was that transition like into full-time art? When did you start to feel, maybe I could ask it this way. When, when did you start to feel like you were getting some real traction with your with your painting and then really just jumping in with both feet into that direction i think when our band was breaking up slowly kind of fizzling out in 2007 yeah. um, i started to paint more and i was at the time just experimenting with random abstract things of all sorts um, but not really getting serious into what i'm doing now uh, until like a year after that when i just decided to dive into, like I discovered Peter Bruegel at a bookstore, used bookstore in Calgary. And I was like, where has this guy been all my life? Like I was almost ashamed that I had no art education, you know? I mean, <laughs> so <laughs> once I realized all this history that I'd never seen before, I just bought as many books as I can from used bookstores and, and tried to copy some of that. And that was about 2008. Um, and then I found that the longer that I took into something, the better it got. So um, what was the first thing? I, I tried to paint like a, a figure that was like one six human scale, roughly on like a dollar store canvas that was like eight by 10 or something. And I got really frustrated right away because of the, the groove in the canvas was so rough. And um, so I was frustrated with trying to get these little tiny details, but I found that whatever I pushed myself to do, I could do if I just took more time. Um, quickly going back to the music thing, uh, I did the all three of the album covers, and the second album cover was one where I actually had a deadline and I really had to push myself. So I think at the time I put like 40 hours, you know, so like four days into it, and I had a little deadline where I had to actually have the album cover done. It was just a pen drawing. Um, and I remember at the time that was the longest, most serious artwork that I had done in terms of time dedication. And then when I finished it, I was like, whoa, I did it. This is better than anything I've ever done before because I had to. And so that became the test for me. And it was like a field test that showed like, you know, the more you put into this, the more you can get out of it. So at that time, I had never put any more time into a piece of art before. So I just decided to try to copy a little Bruegel piece and, you know, put a, I don't know, 30 or 40 hours into that and felt good about it. And, um, 
once I moved away from Calgary uh, into this place in the middle of nowhere by Lumbee, BC, uh, I started painting uh, the the one final actual painting uh, that's still on my website at the very, very bottom right now. When it's a total kind of like Peter Bruegel copy in terms of color and the mood of the whole thing, it's kind of like a total ripoff of, of his thing, but with my own characters. And I put probably 500 hours into that. Uh, and I was able to do that because I, I had this confidence knowing that the more I put into something, the more it'll turn out the way that I want it to turn out. And it was pretty much from there that I knew that this was something I was going to do. And I shifted inside. Like I was still playing music quite seriously and practicing every day. Um, but that gradual shift, they kind of replaced each other a little bit. There was like an overlap where the music got a bit less serious and the art became more serious. And then it wasn't until I think at some point in 2010 when I lived in Victoria that I realized that if I really, really want to do this painting, I kind of have to dedicate a lot more to painting than to music. Cause I just, I had gigs where I was trying to play, um, you know, I was practicing a couple hours a day to learn new songs, playing cover songs and then my original songs and also painting all day with just my left hand. So there was actually a point when I was playing a gig and I had to take an ibuprofen in between sets because I was cramping up with my left hand. It was just constantly doing stuff, either painting or playing guitar with the same hand over and over and over again. Um, so there was a physical limitation there, which I encountered. Um, and at that point I kind of realized, okay, I have to, I have to focus a bit more on the art part of it. And then by the time I moved to uh, Toronto in 2012, um, I didn't pursue music. I still play as I do today, but I didn't pursue it really seriously. Yeah. So that's, um, it's interesting. There's a few things that you said there that I want to kind of circle back and, and talk about a little bit, because when you say something like, like, um, spending more time on a painting, like taking 500 hours to, to dedicate to a single work of art. Like I look at that at first, I'm like really impressed. I understand what that's like. But I'm, I'm constantly in a battle myself at the easel kind of going, am I overworking this? Am I going too far down this path? Am I trying to put too much into it? And, you know, there was this thing. I, I don't know if you had this from like, uh, you know, friends or critics or maybe even gallerists or, or people who would look at your work before it's done, who would just go, oh, no, 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 don't do any more. Just leave it just like that. And you're like, that's the block in, dude. You know, just so I, I'm, I'm constantly in a battle myself between having something that's beautifully understated and just seems a little bit more graceful in its execution versus, no, I'm going to just drive this thing home as far as I can and pour as much as I can into it. How do you find that balance for yourself? Have you started to pull back a little bit or are you very much in that frame of mind still more time equals better art? Um, I think the difference between the mindset that a lot of people are learning and what, what maybe a lot of galleries want to um, to put forth commercially and economically is there's two different worlds completely like the, the world that um, painters are going for back in, you know, to the Renaissance and to the Dutch golden age and neoclassical and the, the goal that they had in mind and the goal that everything after the 20th century, you know, had in mind. I think those are two completely different worlds. The, totally different worlds and that whole idea of like overworking something and that's uh i think that's um it's just not compatible um i think time is the most precious thing right you can't there's certain shortcuts that you just you can't um there's there's no way to get like a secret course that you can take or a brush or or a product or something that will do what time does and much of the art of that is making our life so that we have the time it's it's designing and crafting our life first and foremost to be able to do that and then putting all that effort into it but um now i don't put uh all that time into it in terms of feeling like i need to paint every leaf on every little tree in the background and like the the early northern european painters wanted to do um, that's how I started, but I don't do that anymore. I have scaled back, but I spend a lot more time now in my preliminary work. So my um, 
everything that happens before the painting starts, I spend tons of time. I mean, I, I might spend anywhere from 40 to 50 to 100 hours um, building models, doing photo shoots, working in Photoshop, redrawing, reinventing. Um, because when I get to that point, I can finally get to where I always wanted to go before that, which was to create a believable three-dimensional feeling to this scene. Where you, like a, this little three-dimensional feeling where you feel like you can reach in and, and grab one of the characters or something. You can kind of, as the viewer, you can walk into the scene and sit down there. I always wanted to create that, but I didn't know how to create that when I first started painting. So that's why I had to take hundreds of hours to make a painting look kind of, you know, to represent that kind of feeling that I had. Eventually, that's when I learned I, I want to do all these photo shoots and things to create references um, because it was actually kind of kind of a little bit quicker maybe in the end and it also I was able to get further so instead of spending sometimes like I would spend you know six hours painting a garment on one of the characters and then realize oh it's you know it's not the right color or it's too light or it's too dark and then I'd scrape all the paint off and then start again um, just because I'm extremely stubborn so I, I might be there for 14 hours you know <laughs> chasing this making it work right and then realizing later that if I can just create a reference that shows me like 90% of what I need to know or really even 60 or 70% of what I need to know then it's much more efficient in the end so that's where I'm at now so the balance between putting too much time into it and, and not I think is um, pretty clear to me now I don't I don't question that so much anymore what I do question is the apples and oranges kind of subjective part of it where somebody might paint something and have like a vague background or a background that's not really there and, you know, finish three quarters of the picture and then leave the rest of it. You know, I think that can be really cool and, that, but that's not what I do. Um, so I think that's, that's a stylistic choice that maybe somebody might make, which I haven't been confused about because I've been kind of set in my ways. <laughs> well, I, I can certainly see the, the Bruegel aspect and, and that influence coming through and, and it's still in, in your work now, if you don't mind me saying, because there's this real otherworldly, surrealistic, very fantastic kind of quality to it and also in terms of the subject matter that, that you're taking but again if i hadn't said it before uh, let me say it now exceptionally well done like the, your paintings blow me away man and the Thank thing you. the thing that i i really enjoy about it is when realism kind of gets into this otherworldly aspect where you make the 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 fantasy feel real you make the um I, I'm struggling for the word, but you'll you'll have it for me. Um, but but it's a situation that, that that's not real. It doesn't exist. Yet you're using your knowledge as a painter to render that three dimensional form. And I, I appreciate that. I, I also appreciate that that you're you're detailing everything from foreground and subject right the way through to the background because you're looking at these little works. And I understand you know some of them from looking at at your website and also work on Instagram some of them are quite small but they're just beautiful little gems so I, I really want to encourage anybody listening to this make sure you check out steve's work because it is just stunning really really cool stuff there was one post though that, that you made on instagram where it kind of it, it it got me you fooled me and um it was a neat little trick you were painting the details around the nail of a wooden structure that had been hammered together and as, first I, I looked at that and I thought, oh, cool. So he's painting the model that he's going to paint from. And I was like, oh, no, that's the painting. It was so neat. It was really, really cool. Thank you. Uh, that was a, an actual raft. Like I made a raft. It was like one six human scale. So like Barbie doll scale size and um, and used that as the model. And then that was from a little video that I made. Uh, yeah. So that's that's I think that's what I kind of hoped to do. Um, yeah. <laughs> what was the question before that sort? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, good. We're all good. We're good. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just geeking out about your art, man. I, I, I think, I think it's really, really cool. Yeah. Thank you. There's too much to say. There really is. There's, there's too much. I feel that when I teach some art classes now, I'm teaching mostly beginners and I feel yeah. like there's just too much. So yeah. we might as well just take a breath and get some coffee and... <laughs> Cheers. So uh, there, the there is um there is one um there's one quote from from Virgil Elliot in, in our podcast that we did together that I really love. And he said, talking about art is like dancing about architecture. 
<laughs> and and I just I love that so much because it's perfect. It, it yeah, it's just absolutely perfect. But here's the thing, you know, there's it, it it's such a treat to be able to talk with you and, and artists like you as well because what I'm finding the more I do this podcast is how many approaches there are to this thing, the, this creative journey. And I guess in a way what I'm doing is I'm kind of reacting to this the way we've set up life, the way we've set up our culture and society. Because when I first started out, you know, there were so many people saying, Andrew, you can't do that. You're not going to make any money. You're going to starve to death. Now, look, I was very lucky, a bit like you. I had supportive parents. I, I, my father in particular was very supportive. And he just said, you know, you can do absolutely anything you want. You want to be an artist. Let's go for it. You know, you, you could do it. Um, but, he, but he said, but you can't half-ass it. You've got to go all in. Um, because if you if you don't put in the effort, you're not going to get the results. And mm -hmm. so I guess the, the main point of this podcast and, and maybe where we can go uh, for, for a little while here, I, I have a lot of younger people listening to this and a lot of people who want to have art be their career and their main thing, but they're still stuck in a job or they're stuck in school, maybe studying a degree that they don't have any interest in or they really can't see a future in. Meanwhile, this thing's gnawing at the back of them, just saying, you know what? I want to go into, into the creative world. I want to produce art. I want to make money. I want to have an exhibition. I want to show in galleries or do commissions or sell my work online. So I guess this is the real treat in, in talking with people like yourself is, how do you make that work? Could you give us a snapshot maybe of the business side of things and how you're working now? Do you work towards exhibitions? Do you work on commission basis? Do you sell prints? How does it work for you, Steve? Um, it started out accidentally for me, like just like any other person wanting to make art. That was always my goal was to be able to spend as much time as possible actually making the art to so that I could go as deep as I wanted to and not be limited by space or resources or, well, time is the main one. Um, and so I guess I can only reflect on that just by telling my, my story of how I started with that. So um, I was playing music and never had any pressure to make art for, you know, to sell at all for quite a while. Did little experiments and it was just my own fun time. And then uh, when I moved to Victoria, BC and Vancouver Island in 2008, um, I started to get more serious about it and knew that I wanted to do something. So I was spending a lot of time painting, but there was still no pressure, right? Because I was still in that position where I didn't have to paint for a living. Um, so all the time that I spent painting, which was still a lot of time, like probably 40 hours a week, aside from teaching guitar lessons and playing local gigs at pubs and stuff like that. Um, so I was putting a lot of effort into something that I knew would eventually go somewhere, but I didn't yet know how I had no clue. I just, I just wanted to paint. And the first thing that I did was a street fair. Uh, it was called the Moss street painting. So, uh, M O S S that's the name of the street that the art gallery of greater Victoria is on. And every year for many years, they've done an outdoor fair that spans many, many blocks. And there's like a couple hundred artists that line the streets and they have tents. And it's not really a fair like for sales so much as it is like a public demonstration or whatever you want it to be, really. And there was it was fairly low pressure as well. It was curated. So there is that first initial hurdle that anyone has to to jump is getting getting your work into places where you might there might be some sort of curation you have to get past that hurdle of, you know, producing work in JPEG images and stuff like that so that somebody can see it. And I mean, I didn't have that much at the beginning. I only had like three paintings in JPEGs and then another one that I wasn't even proud of. And I was like, well, I have to have so many to put into this uh, submission. So here you go. <laughs> um, lucky enough, they, they uh, accepted me and um, I had no expectations, no pressure. But I was also kind of excited because I didn't know what to expect. Um, and people responded really well, like to my surprise. Um, you know, it was a funny situation where it was like outside. I didn't even have a tent. I didn't even have business cards. 
Um, I was playing music that weekend. So that was like after playing music and the two guys that I was playing music with were also like walking around the fair. And I was like trying to like write my name on these tiny little ripping up pieces of paper to put my name and my website on there to give to people. <laughs> and my one friend, the bass player who was there, it's like, why don't you just make an email list and just people can sign it. And then you don't have to keep ripping up pieces of paper. Um, so it's like totally green, right? It's just starting with no knowledge of anything. I didn't know how art galleries worked, how any of the business worked at all. But I kind of think that's a bit of a blessing because this happened to be at the time when everything was kind of changing. So I was coming into a new place, not knowing that everyone had just turned the corner. I guess it's like, uh, you know, a kid growing up with an electric guitar, not knowing that people didn't have electric guitars before 1940 something or 50 something, right? It's like, it's always been there, but it's like, no, actually it hasn't. You're lucky to, to come into this world exactly when you did. And I feel that I was coming into the world like, you know, just a few years before Instagram, um, not knowing how things work and all of a sudden accidentally stumbling into the, the other way to have a career at this, which is by representing yourself. So from my first couple fairs that I had done, I didn't even expect to sell anything. Um, and I, I didn't at the first couple fairs. Um, but then in the third year that I did the same fair, somebody from the gallery asked me if I wanted to be in a group show that was at the art gallery, Greater Victoria. And it was with three other artists that were, you know, 10, 20 years older than me and had been around for a while. And I had three paintings in that show. Um, and the person that, uh, was curating the show encouraged me to price my work confidently, you know, and to not just be like, oh, I can't, poor me, I don't want to, you know, um, give me some crumbs, you know. So I did price my work confidently and it sold one of the, one of the paintings sold. And then of course I got 50%, which was great to me. And, um, it was shortly after that, that we planned to move to Toronto and start fresh from there again. Um, you know, had had a couple interesting experiences with galleries when I first got there and also had some really good experience. Um, but through all of this, I don't really know what, you know, there's a certain element of, of each individual where you're going to have to figure things out for yourself because there's no one rule. I think that's why art is so special. It's not like a pro sports league or something. Risk If you want to play in the NBA, you know, there's a kind of a set path to get there and there's a few variations to that path, but there's one very clear place where you want to end up. And with art, it's not that way at all. So I think the things that are particular to me, I can't say, you know, do this and then this will happen because I don't know that that's going to happen. All I know is that I did sell one piece, which gave me a lot of confidence before I moved to the big city. And once I got there, um, I won a, an award in this, uh, I think it's Canada's largest outdoor juried exhibition. So that gave me a lot of confidence as well. Um, but I had been through the stress of, of like wondering, you know, laying awake at night, wondering how I'm going to pay the rent kind of a thing. You know, I'd been through that a few times by that point. And it's crazy. I, I'm not like, uh, I went through stages in my life where I was kind of like, you know, woo woo, like reading a lot of uh, books that, kind of go in that direction. And I would say I'm more empirical now, but, uh, I, I think there has been almost like these little signs along the way that like every time I started to get really stressed out, I would just work really hard and finish something and hope that somebody on my email list, which I'd started collecting back in 2009 or 10, I would just hope that somebody on my list would buy something. And it pretty much worked out every single time. And oftentimes it was one person after maybe not hearing anything for two weeks and starting to get really stressed and be like, Oh my, nobody in my entire list responded to this last email. This is terrible. This is the worst. And then somebody respond and be like, Hey, uh, by the way, is that piece still available? And I guess, yes, it's available. I'd like get back to him as soon as possible. And, um, and it just worked out like, but I, I really think the main element for me has been pushing myself as much as possible all the time. I mean, I just, just to give an idea, like I, from a young age, I've been very serious about what I do. I try not to consciously now take myself too seriously, but I've always been extremely serious about what I'm doing. Like my mom used to say, you don't 
don't be so hard on yourself. Like when I was a kid, cause it was always like, you know, whatever I was doing or whatever I was saying to make her say that. But, um, I've always been extremely focused, uh, on what I'm doing. And I think that that can apply to anyone. I think the power of the human mind is pretty much infinite. If we learn to focus it, it's like a magnifying glass, right? It does nothing until we get the sun beam just right. And you can melt something with it. You know what I mean? It's like that focus. Um, and if we focus hard enough on one thing in particular, I think that's when things happen. Um, and that's what I generally don't see enough of. I think there's so many distractions today. Um, short term gratification in general, I think is, uh, probably one of the biggest hangups that people have in general. Um, it's always that long goal. And I always had that in mind in the back of my head that I want to do this for years and years and years. So I don't have to rush into something that feels good or answer some scam email that makes me feel like I'm going to be the next big artist in this new book they're putting out and they want $400 from me or something. Like I never felt tempted by that stuff because I always was patient about my career and where I'm going and what I'm doing. And, um, and along the way, I've always been motivated constantly by the feeling that there's no ceiling. Like I still feel like I have so much further to go and the harder I push myself, um, the better it gets. That being said by harder, I don't mean like, you know, more detailed or for painting for more hours or something like that. It's kind of focusing in on what really matters. And for me now, what really matters is really thinking about story and subject matter and things like that. Um, whereas an earlier in my career, I think focusing on what mattered is what is, what am I weakest at? Like what are the four or five elements to me as an artist and which one of those is the weakest thing that I really need to work at? So it's an, it's a whole, all about self-awareness, I guess. Um, yeah. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. I I, I love I love where where you went there. And uh, but I I'm gonna pull you up on something. Sorry to do this. I don't mean to embarrass you. Let's get a bit woo woo. You read yes. The, you read the secret, didn't you? Actually, <laughs> no, no. I read books like that. Okay. So what are some of your what are some of your titles? What are your favorite woo woo titles? You know, the first book actually, I would recommend this to anyone young. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I hope that. Um, like my nieces and nephews, I, I don't know if they'll watch this, but any, anybody that's young, like when I was like 15 or 16, I read a book that we happened to have in our bookshelf at home on the farm in Northern Alberta. Um, it was called the power of your subconscious mind by Dr. Joseph Murphy. Wow. Um, and there's a lot of books like that now. I think you can find that even in audiobook form on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And it, it will probably link to all these other bi books like Think to Grow Rich and, you know, all these kinds of things like that. that that's a great book, by the way. <laughs> yeah, love, there's so many. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the links in YouTube have yeah. now made everything in a silver platter for us, right? Whereas yeah. when before the Internet, you had to strive a little bit to get something. And I mm -hmm. think that's that's so huge, the way that we appreciate what we have now compared to not um, – so before I get back to that, that book, I just wanted like when I played guitar, I remember going into the local music store and there was all these books on the shelf of instructional videos. And the guy that worked there was like, oh yeah, I have all these videos and blah, blah, blah. This one didn't really work for me. I like this one, you know, blah, blah, blah. He had this huge collection of videos. And I remember my bass player, Tyler and I, we both kind of like behind this guy's back. We we're like, he's not very good. <laughs> like, he's got all these videos, but he's not I'm clearly not using them. So to me, there was always this feeling about like, it doesn't matter how many resources you have. It's about using it to its fullest potential. If you have one book, reading every sentence and really letting it soak in instead of having a big bookshelf behind you, be like, yeah, I read all these books. So, you know, it's like, I'm a speed reader and I can just blah, 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 read everything, right? Like it's a matter of using it to its full, like I said, just already being redundant. But um, so that book for me was so powerful because, and this is the power of your subconscious mind by Dr. Joseph Mercy. It was basically just saying that you are your thoughts. Like if you think all day long, like I'm terrible, I can't do this, then voila, there you go. Um, and I, I guess on the surface that sounds pretty obvious, but the, some of the points that really weren't as obvious, I guess, were points like thinking about the subconscious or unconscious mind. Uh, like a ship. So they'd have like the people in the bottom of the ship that are are actually making the engine work. And then there's the ship captain up top who can actually see where we need to go. So he's like, oh, we're going to go, we need to go 20 degrees to the left. And then he'll send that command down to the 
engine workers in the bottom of the ship and then they make that happen. They don't know where they're going, they just take commands and it's the one at the top. So it's kind of like our conscious mind is saying like, I don't know why I need to uh, you know, be positive or uh, smile when I meet strangers or something like that. I don't really know why, but I'm gonna do it just because I think that's the right thing to do. And so by doing that, it sets this habit and this principle uh, of positivity and of uh, useful energy that we can use going forward to make everything in our life different. Even if everything is just like a little bit different, um, it changes everything. But yeah, the secret, I was familiar with that years years later when I actually got out of those books a little bit. I was influenced by a friend of mine to get into Western philosophy and I'm a, like a wannabe smart person. Like I don't, I, <laughs> I, I really, I've never had to write papers on anything like that, but I'm obsessed with learning about all that stuff, right? So I'm like, uh, listening to university lectures all the time. And um, uh, I really feel like if I didn't have any artistic ability, I would have gone into academics, absolutely for sure. And if I would go into those with the um, with the mindset of wanting to ad ad advance a field, want to put forth new theories instead of just reading a bunch of stuff and being a parrot and saying like, this is what I read. You know, it's like, you know, this is this is a new idea that I have. Let's experiment. And let's see where it goes. So I guess that's where the artistic side comes from. But um, I think that general principle when I was like 16 reading that book, I read it twice at that time and it felt magical. It really did. It felt like all the stuff that I see in front of me is no suggestion of what I have to do. I can do anything. And yeah, then getting into like Eckhart Tolle, I'm not sure if you know him. Um, the idea of ego, uh, you know, which I think now is a very clever, it's a very intricate balance that we need to strike with having too much ego and not enough. There's like a, there's a yin yang going on there. Um, Deepak Chopra, uh, there was one book of his called The Way of the Wizard. Uh, which was really good for me at a certain point in my life when I was like, uh, just moved to Victoria. I went through a really tough breakup and I needed something. And that was a point, a transformational point in my life where I was really getting serious about painting and reading stuff like that. And then I got into this other series was like the ringing cedars of Russia. And uh, my roommate at the time also read the book and he was like, this is a bunch of garbage. <laughs> He's like, you, you got to read, um, you know, read some, some other more critical things. And so I started, I downloaded this huge audio book. I think it was Birch and Russell, uh, introduction to Western philosophy. And then I listened to that kind of stuff while painting and became hooked. So I, at this moment claim to know nothing, but hopefully that's still more than some of the younger people that might be listening to this. I, I think I think it's really important to recognize our, our, our own limitations and how little we actually know. The, the more that you know, the more you realize that you, you don't know. There was this, um, there, there was this thing that I saw. Uh, I became obsessed with um, Michael Stevens is his name, and he's got a channel on YouTube called Vsauce. And there was one video where he was talking about knowledge being a light in a darkened room. And or, or like a can, I can't remember if he said it was a candle or a flashlight, but anyway, the, the analogy still works where everything that is black and everything that is out there in the darkened room is, is the unknown. But the light, you know, when you have a little bit of knowledge, it's a little bit of light, but the boundary of what is known and what is unknown is very very small. It feels like, you know, you, 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 you know, quite a lot, but then as you begin to know more and more and more, that boundary between known and unknown is bigger and bigger and bigger. The more you realize, man, there's so much more there that, that mm -hmm. we can know. And I, and I find this, you know, as I kind of get into books and listening to things, audio books, talks, Ted talks, you know, I've got wide interests, not just in art as well, but I realize, wow, man, I need to really check back in here and just, <laughs> You know, especially with painting, right? I mean, there's so mm -hmm. many things that we can learn just with painting alone. There's so much stuff going on. The learning curve yeah. for me has been really, really steep. Um, that's that's so fascinating. You know, I, again, I want to, I just want to echo a couple of a couple of other things that you said there that I, that I really love, um, because in my experience, the the positivity side of things and 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 getting your mind right and approaching situations and people in, in a way that is positive 
that has made all of the difference in my career, but also just thinking in a way that is a little bit more on the positive side. I, I have personally I have the tendency to be quite negative and really hard on myself, put myself down, drive myself down. And, and I have other people, fortunately, in my life that kind of help build me back up again, which gets tiring for them. I've gotten better in, in, in recent years of, of being able to check myself without going over in the, to those dark places. But I found that whenever the wolf was starting to get really close to the door and that rent check was, was you know, going to be late or, or I wasn't sure how I was going to eat or, you know, especially early on. Again, I had those same experience of going, no, it'll be okay. Let's just bury ourselves in this project. Let's let's make this painting as good as we can. Let's email that list. Again, it's, it's almost virtually identical to what you were going through. And yeah. something will happen. Something always happens. And, and this is the thing I've been blessed with. By, by keeping that faith, by keeping that um, positivity and that approach, I think what it's done is it's actually changed the decisions that I was making. It actually has a physical consequence because... If you get down and out and you give in to that negativity, you're not thinking, what are my options here? You start thinking, I need, I need to pull the ripcord on this thing. I need a, re I need a rescue plan. I need somebody to save me. I, I, so you're, you start giving in to that desperation rather than continually being fueled by inspiration. So I think by staying on that positive thing, you're like, okay, well, how could I use this? How could I turn this around? How could I change the situation? What do what resources do I have at my fingertips right now that that could could turn this whole thing around? And when you start thinking like that, then sure enough, things start happening. But if mm -hmm. you're if you're attached to that outcome and the way it is delivered to you, that can be problematic. But if you just throw it wide open, and say, okay, well, I'm going to do the best I can with what I got. Let's see where the the chips fall. Sometimes they fall in your favor more often than not. Absolutely. That's one of the things I found inspiring about first listening to your podcast was that you were touching on a lot of those subjects, which I think is, I mean, there's so much online uh, for art instruction, just about this is how to paint, this is color theory, this is how to use this kind of product. And mm -hmm. I think the real meat of art is everything else. It's all the mind stuff. Um, so that's why I think it's really good to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, I like to use the analogy of a compass, um, thinking about, you know, if you're holding a compass in your hand and you're able to turn the needle, um, in actual physical reality, that compass might be like two inches or, you know, five centimeters in diameter and you turn the needle and it only moves maybe a few millimeters. And that doesn't seem like a big deal cause it's not, but after a thousand kilometers or a thousand miles in the direction that you decide to turn the needle at the end of that span, it's massive and it's the turning the needle sooner in your life when you have the opportunity to make choices. Um, that's when it will really pay off in the long run and you won't know it until you get there. But a really big thing is the people that are closest to us as well. Um, my partner Ingrid is, um, she's been a massive inspiration to me and I think that's why I wanted to be with her when I first met her because she was the type of person that was endlessly positive and always look to the bright side of everything. And, um, it always worked out for her. like, she, I remember one time, uh, she was making this outdoor theater show in Victoria and she'd done that. She did this run of like 10 shows during the Victoria fringe festival. I'm not sure if they have those kind of festivals in New Zealand or, um, but sh she did all these shows and they were, they went well and they were successful and there was supposed to be one more show at the end of it. Um, on a, on a Sunday or something like that. And that, that morning it was raining. It was like terrible, terrible weather. And I remember feeling tired from the night before or whatever, and just feeling like, I don't want to do anything today. It's just one of those days. I think a lot of young people can relate to that feeling. I know everybody can in, at whatever age, but there's that feeling of low energy, low motivation. Um, and I think most of it is mental, but, um, I had that feeling that day and I was like, are you actually going to do this show today? Like nobody's going to show up. Like, this is crazy. Like, even if you get five people, is it really worth it? And she's like, no, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. So she got this, you know, had to go to this rental place to rent the equipment again. And I went with her reluctantly and was setting up this stuff in the rain. And, and little do you know, like an hour later, it started to let up a little bit and the day got a little bit brighter. And then by the time the show came, they actually had a full house and they had this whole outdoor 
tent area like full every single seat was full they had a great show it was one of their best shows because the all the dancers were um like there was like steam coming off their bodies just because of the the weather conditions you know and and the heat of and so they got the best photos that, that they got in the entire run on that last day because of that all this kind of stuff you know and i remember just seeing examples like that and thinking um that's 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 where you that's that's it that's the whole key right there is like if there's an actual physical limitation and we can't do something then that's legitimate but most of the stuff that we encounter when it comes to motivation in life is is mental and it's actually just a matter of pushing ourselves a little bit more and saying like okay my, you know is this just an excuse or is this totally legitimate and i think a lot of times the, you know, what we're taking in our mental diet, which is just as important as the physical diet, the people that we're listening to on a regular basis, um, especially somebody really close, like a partner, like a romantic partner. Um, these people that we choose to be with are, it's, I can't even say enough, but it's just, you know, it's everything. It really is. Yeah, I can, again, I can echo that. I mean, I just, I, I know how important Rachel's been for me, you know, my, my wife and um, uh, in terms of the positivity and that, that nurturing and, and just, you know, helping me just kind of focus on the bright side again and say, no, it's not that bad. It would be okay. You know, it keeps, she keeps pushing me, which is, yeah. which is good. I mean, sometimes in art, sometimes you do need it. Cause I think creatives by and large creatives are, are, fragile emotional people <laughs> in my experience most of us are we wear our heart on our sleeves and i think there's an element of that that we we have to because that's what allows us to create our best work it's that sensitivity it's mm -hmm. not it's not only a sensitivity i think if you're going to be sensitive to the visual if you're creating something visual you're really touching on sensitivity in a wide area of places and it makes us i think emotionally sensitive too and, and yep. again just sticking with that optimism sticking with that positivity there's there's a great question from um two people that i really like that i continuously refer to and, and drop their name in the podcast and one of them is tony robbins you know i'm a big tony robbins fan but that one question whenever a situation happens i i remember i'll tell you a story if you, if you don't mind steve um when yeah. I, I i had a big artist residency in in recent years and I produced a, the equivalent of like a small exhibition to take aboard this, this ship. And there, I was so proud of the work, man. It was framed beautifully. I spent weeks just on the framing. I was framing it myself, gilding the frames, you know, all handmade. But painting, it took me months to put this together. And, and I, I, I was just loving every minute of it. And I remember taking the hire van to drive to the port to, to get on the boat and how full that van was. And then driving after after the the exhibition, and after my my stint aboard, driving that van home. More full than when I had left. <laughs> How does that work? It works because they said, well, you didn't sell anything, but we also have these two paintings that you left on board last time. You need to take these back too. And I'm like. <laughs> Oh, and I remember Rachel, like this was one of the times, this was kind of bizarre. Rachel was kind of like looking at me as I was driving home. She's like, are you okay? And I was like, I shouldn't be, but I'm totally fine. And she's like, why? Because <laughs> she's like, I know you. Normally you'd be freaking out. I'm like, because I know it's going to get better. I know that I'm going to learn something from this. And so I remember that Tony Robbins quote, how could I use this? How could yeah. I use this? And maybe I could use it. Maybe I was thinking at the time, this would be a really silly story to drop into a podcast one day. But, yeah. you know, without, but I, I, I always think back to that and go, you know, that, that didn't break me. That didn't get, like, that was a lot of work and no money off the back of it. And it also cost me a little something to make all of that happen with the hiring of the vehicle and some accommodation costs and, and various things. So it was not a, uh, a positive money-making exercise. It, it certainly didn't help me get my my name out there at all. The people on board just looked at it and went, oh, that's cute, kid. Yep, keep working. I'm like, wow. And here I was, I was thinking, I'm an established artist. I've had sellout exhibitions. I've done commissions for so-and-so, you know, and, and here it was, I was driving back with all my work and then some. So yeah. I think I think what happens is is we we need to have, even in those, you know, terrible times, the worst of times, 
that kind of question continuously gone, hey, this isn't killing me. How can I use it? You know, and um, yeah, I, I love that we've had an opportunity to, to cover some of this because this is something that I, I've become really obsessed with in, in, in recent years as well is, is that whole mindset thing. And, and I, I do enjoy going into these places with the podcast. So I just appreciate so much having somebody to kind of listen to and, and, and bounce these ideas off as well. It's, it's great, man. It is great. It's amazing what a little bit of information can do for us. You know, hearing just a quote or something like that, you know, it helps us make decisions because I think that's the toughest part about life in general is decision making. There, there's always it's caloric, caloric energy, right? Like it, it's tough to make decisions. And so we generally go to the path of least resistance always. And that's why we, you know, eat a potato chip and then eat another one and then eat another one and eat another one because it's just like that's what our brain is telling us to do. And I think that's what makes us most human is to be able to to take our own um, internal uh, natural, what do you call it, um, or natural intuitions or inclinations and and change them and, you know, turn them to to something else and. I mean, then once again, it leads to long term versus short term gratification. It's like, why am I sacrificing comfort in this moment so that I can have a better tomorrow or maybe not even until next month or next year or 10 years from now? I mean, I'm thinking about myself 10 years from now. That's that's kind of how I'm thinking about my career. And um, so I, I think it's it's helped a lot to have those kinds of influences and whatnot. I, I like the the analogy that you were giving before about, you know, a ship and a compass, you know, because I, I often put it in that way where, you know, you, 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 your ship's on the water, it's, it's a tumultuous sea, but you have a point on the horizon that you're aiming for. And if you're aiming at something way off in the distance, if you're one or two degrees out, it doesn't seem like much at that time, does it? I mean, but it's, it is literally the, the accumulation of these small things. So I think what, one of the things that I really love, you know, as an artist, as a creative professional, is to really check in on the daily with what are my goals? Like, how is what I'm doing today actually helping me get to that long-term vision? Because if, if I'm doing something today that's totally unrelated or totally you know irrelevant or destructive or it's get, knocking yeah. me off course in the smallest way, then I, I'm not going to get there. And um, yeah. that, that really helps inform, okay, what am I going to do with my daily routine? How am I going to actually make this work? So I, yeah. can, tell, I can tell goals and, and goal setting is something that, that's important for you. Are you, are you one of these guys that, that also, you know, writes them down and, and reads them and reflects on them? Um, no, I'd say my uh, only form of writing down is generally painting ideas. Um, that's my visual journal, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I think my life is pretty simple and that my goals are uh, concise enough that I could write them down on one very tiny piece of paper. And, um, so therefore it's kind of permanently planted in my brain. It's like an app that's permanently downloaded into my, into the hardware of my brain. And so I don't, don't need to sort of reformulate it all the time. But, um, that reminds me of a really short story I heard one time about, um, a rowing team and their coach, or I guess when we call them the rowing master, uh, was telling them, you know, you guys are huge underdogs. Nobody expects you to do very well. But from this day until the Olympics, and it was like two year time period or something, we're going to make all of our decisions in our lives based on whatever makes the boat go faster. And so that was the saying that they had for like two years was, should I, you know, go out and party tonight? Or should I do this? Or should I go there? Should I eat this? Should I drink this? And every single decision was made by how, whatever makes a boat go faster. And I think that's the same for uh, everything today. And I know personally how I feel having such a direct focus in my life compared to when I was sometimes in my early 20s. You know, I have the f memory of like a couple of friends come to town and you're sort of like wandering down the street, twiddling your thumbs, looking for something to do you know, just this gang of these young guys kind of just like kind of scratching their head like, oh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what comes up. And to me, like, I feel so much the opposite of that now. I just feel like get out of my way. Like I got something to do. Like I, I don't have time for that anymore. And so I feel the only, you know, I, I look forward to what I'm doing, right? Like I want to do what I'm doing. And so um, it's that whole purpose thing to me, which has, uh, 
given me that sort of whatever makes the boat go faster kind of a kind of a decision making process. So it's like every time I have a tough decision to make, it's always like, well, what's the end result? You know, not excuses or reasons, but what's the end result going to be? And um, I mean, the the conversation about human purpose is an endless thing in and of itself, right? Like in terms of subject matter of art, and I'm always thinking about like, you know, artificial intelligence and the future of, uh, you know, jobs being taken away and, and art becoming more and more of a thing that can be sort of like push button digitalized in some ways. And it's like, what gives us purpose? Like what makes us feel like we have, uh, you know, a, a, a job to do. And, and I think that's so important. Like we need to have that, have that feeling in order to be motivated to go forward again. Interesting that you brought that up. Um, I've been thinking about that quite a lot recently with, with a lot of this talk of AI coming on online and, um, it, it terrifies me. It also excites me in certain ways, but I, I do worry about that sometimes. Um, again, I guess we got to try and stay on the positive side of things, don't we? But how do you, <laughs> how do you feel about that in particular? Because there are, there was this, um, ah, oh, forget, I forget which auction house did it, but there was a portrait painted by AI and it sold at auction and it sold for a lot of money. Do you remember that story? No, there, I've heard of AI making art. Like I heard about a robot that was drawing or something like that, but I didn't see that one specifically. I want to say it was Sotheby's, but it was it was some big auction house. I could be wrong, so people could probably Google this and, and do a bit of research here. But I remember seeing the 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 portrait that was produced, and it wasn't a bad portrait. But what they had done is they they had kind of fed the machine all of the masters and like hundreds of thousands of images of, of telling this machine and it was learning, hey, this makes a good portrait. So then it produces this thing that looks like a Francis Bacon meets Rembrandt. It's kind of like it's well done, it's well executed, but it's a little bit ghostly and a little bit spooky and a little bit on the loose side of things. It's, it's like it's kind of was strange. I was looking at this portrait going, we're all going to die. <laughs> so it's like it's like here's here's this like this thinking feeling machine maybe i projected a little bit but it can now paint uh, what is this going to do for the artist mm -hmm. i don't think i would suspect that it might have sold for quite a lot at auction because it was a first maybe yeah and yeah, that's uh, so. that's a huge thing in the art world like the whole history of modern art is based on firsts i think like whoever came up with this idea right because as far as I know, I'm not an academic, but um, one of the main ideas in postmodern theories is is that um, you know originality in art is so much more important than technique and all those kinds of things. So if it's a fish in a blender or whatever, um, as long as it was a first in some kind or or like uh, excrement in a can, tin can or whatever, mm. then that's what matters, right? So I think that maybe that's the reason that it's sold. Um, so I think that's one of the positive things that we can look at in light of all of the potential scariness that we see in movies and stuff like that about artificial intelligence and um, this dystopian stuff, right? I think there's so much positive to look at what's happening right now with, for example, collectors that are buying representational art, whether they know it or not, they're supporting the genuine article. They're supporting human talent and human ability. And... I, I guess it's it's a matter of like being able to articulate it, right? Like, and I'm struggling with that at this moment. I'm thinking like, what is it about um, the human story that can go into something that makes it different than something where you can just push a button? And I don't, I mean, I wouldn't want to put down anybody that's doing um, art in any other form, whether it's digital art or something like that. I think a lot of it is quite amazing and I can see why, uh, like a, a band or something like a heavy metal band would get a digital artist to make their album cover because they might be able to do something that looks really cool in a quarter the amount of time that it would take somebody to paint that with oil. So there you go. But the, the market of people that are actually supporting original artists who are doing things the old fashioned way, I think that's the line. There's, there's a line to be drawn there. Basically. Um, it might not be a hard line. It might be kind of a wavy line, but, um, for example, I think it's becoming a bit more of a thing now for people that are drawing and painting to like do like hashtag no projector or something like that. So that it's like, 
you know, I spend a lot of years drawing and so I'm not using a projector, things like that. I think, I think that's all part of the story of like what this is. And that makes, helps people to appreciate it so much more than just, um, a 3d printer made this little sculpture and there you go. Right. It's like the credit there has to be given to the people that designed the 3d printer and, and made that in the first place. And, you know, so I, I don't know, I, I'm not too, too concerned. I think as long as, I mean, it's the human world that we're talking about. So as long as there's no external force that like some aliens that come in and say, this has to be a certain way, then we are in the power position to change those things. And people that are collecting art, um, are in the power to support what they're doing right now. And it's already happened with the world of independent artists and art fairs and things like that versus the one way that you had to do it before, right? That's, that's because of private collectors and things. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I get kind of, I'm getting lost on that subject at this point, but no, no, it's, it's perfect. I mean, look, these are big, big subjects, big topics. And it's easy <laughs> yeah. to, again, as I said, you know, it's easy. We're, we're going to get caught in the weeds a little bit, but, and, and again, that's kind of the point of the podcast. I, I, I always wanted it to be more of a conversation. Let's, you know, let it go where it's going to go. And, and that's great. Um, those are the kind of podcasts that I love listening to, you know, you're like the Joe Rogan of artists podcasts. Stop it. <laughs> stop it hey, he would say the same thing oh <laughs> uh, no okay yes i am well in terms of in volume <laughs> i don't know i don't actually don't know what the what the numbers are with other podcasts that might be remotely similar to yours but um i, I don't it, at the end of the day it's valuable yeah. that's all there is to, to it to pay uh, to be completely honest with you i paid no attention to it at all um, That's good. I, I, I see a little bit of the feedback that comes in in terms of comments and reviews and that sort of thing and feedback, you know, through my website. That's not why I'm doing it. You know, I'm not I'm not doing it for the views. I look, I guess at the end of the day as well, part of me is doing this for selfish reasons as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, here I get a yeah. chance. To, I get a chance to talk to you, pick your brain, yeah. and, and figure out what makes you tick creatively, and and that's awesome. And since starting this podcast from episode one with Caesar Santos and going through all of them, we're nearly at twenty. In fact, this might be episode twenty. Um, and 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 it, so it's not. And I haven't been doing it that long, but already I can feel the shift and the growth happening with myself. But the thing that inspires me is I know deep down somewhere there's one or two people out there hopefully more but there's going to be somebody that hears something and they're going to go man that's the idea or that's the that's the positive word or that's the that's the theme or that's the direction and they just take it and they run with it and and like i've been saying in the podcast so many times and people are probably sick of hearing it but there's never been a better time to be an artist. So we get a chance mm. to do this. We get a chance to talk. You're you're in you're in Canada. I'm in New Zealand. We're on opposite sides of the planet, man. Two different hemispheres talking in real time. And now it's it's it, we get a chance to to share these ideas, but also talk about the fact of, of of all of these different things that are available to us. You know, all of these these avenues that we can we can take you know we can we can go in this direction with our career or in that direction we can show in galleries we don't have to show in galleries we can do private work you know we can post online we don't have to post online we could do it this way through a fair i love that i love that about mm -hmm. art because everybody again everybody i talk to it's a brand new set of circumstances it's a brand new story and it's a brand new journey and i guess a part of what really excites me as well is that somebody would be able to walk along and go, you know, it's almost like walking through a buffet and you got your plate there. And you're like, I'm going to have a little bit of that. Yep, yeah, cool. I have a little bit of the corn. Let's have some peas. Okay, let's have some mussels or whatever. And, and mm -hmm. you, you could just pick and choose whatever the heck you like, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and I hope people will be able to do this from, from the podcast. And um, I love it, man. I love it. Yeah. But I, I do I do listen to probably a little bit too much Joe Rogan. Um, I, I like, I like, I, I wouldn't say I fully endorse everything he's got to say. I like some of it, but sometimes for me, when I, when I, when I'm too dialed in and too focused on like say editing or, or, you know, cause the videos are obviously a massive part, uh, or just thinking a lot about, about things. Sometimes I need him on in the background while I paint or, or doing something like that. Uh, something creative so that my brain can occupy a different space <laughs> because when I, I don't know about you when you paint when you paint and draw 
Are you actually thinking about painting or drawing? It totally depends on the part of the process that I'm in. I think for the yeah. most part, especially nowadays, as I'm working on a couple pieces that are in mid uh, completion, um, I can talk and listen to stuff, whatever. And I love it if there's somebody around, um, that kind of atmosphere. Um, but in the, in the precious stage to me is like, uh, don't have a little sketchbook. Um, but I have like a lot of little sketchbooks with this color paper, like, um, and I will just make tons and tons of little tiny thumbnail sketches. And in that part of the process, that to me is really personal. It's almost like a diary. And I, I wouldn't be able to listen to podcasts and stuff. That's not the point. You know, maybe some instrumental music or something, but uh, something that's not too distracting. Um, but uh, yeah, that's for the most part, most, I guess most of the time is also spent in the painting part. So most of it is thankfully where you can have hours and hours to listen to audiobooks or podcasts or university lectures or whatever, you know, sports, who knows, right? We're so we're so lucky to have that now. And I think that's one thing I would have to reiterate to younger generations is like, not only are we so lucky to have all this stuff, but we also have even on YouTube, there's like audiobooks. One I can think of is uh, like Jack London. Uh, he's talking he was this book about him spending time in the slums of London in the late 1800s. Uh, like, listen to that for three or four hours and then tell me you're not thankful to be living when we are today. Like, <laughs> like there's something to that, you know, and it's on YouTube. There you go. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's wonderful. Like sometimes that comparison and contrast, um, if you ever are feeling like things are a bit dark and things are a bit heavy, so much is going on in today's world, man. There's so much mm -hmm. going on. It's easy to lose your head. And, mm -hmm. and, and, Again, that kind of takes it away from the from the art side, just to bring the mindset back into it a little bit, because I, I just thought of something as you're as you're saying that when we're stressed out, when we're giving into the desperation or the negativity, there's um, a good friend of mine and uh, a psychologist who lives next door <laughs> to me oh, here, nice. here uh, which could be handy. She's wonderful, though. She was telling me that, you know, our brains physiologically, they're 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 orchestrated in such a way that we've got different centers of the brain and each center is, is responsible for a different kind of thought. What happens when we get stressed out, we get negative, we get pessimistic, we go into our fight or flight response. So we're getting into the lower part of the brain or what sometimes people refer to as reptilian brain. And that decision-making process is very binary. It's either do I run or do I fight? Is it on or is it off? And and there's no nuance there. There's no creativity. But when you're in a in a more positive, more joyful, more optimistic uh, frame of mind, the blood flow is available to the whole of the brain, and then you start giving more energy to that the that that frontal cortex, where that's all creative decision making, and then you can really create your best work. And again, this is why I like people like Martini, who who orchestrates it in terms of the seven areas of life. You got to divide your life up into those seven major areas. I couldn't really name all of them off the top of my head. I always miss one or two of them out. But it's things like your health, your mental well-being, your vocation or your career, your relationship, your family, your finances, um, your spiritual side, things like that. So you basically just divide your whole person up into seven areas and you try to empower each one of those areas. Because what I found from the examples of people in my life directly that didn't make it work, couldn't make it work, who were incredibly creative, almost genius level with what they did, but the, they turned over the entire apple cart, so to speak, because one area or two or three areas were totally out of balance. And it took all of the focus and creativity away from what they should have been doing. And, and now suddenly they had a crisis to deal with. You're not gonna, if you're facing a crisis because you neglected something, you're not going to be painting or sculpting or drawing your best. You're not creating Jack. You're not doing anything mm -hmm. there. But what I find is, is that when we empower those areas to the best of our ability, it's not that we're not going to have misfortune because as the Buddhists say, you know, 
life is suffering. There's going to be an element of suffering. There's trial and tribulation that goes, welcome to life. That's, that's what we go through. But it's that we prepare ourselves. We, we have some resilience built up there. At least we're not going to be giving into something like, like an addiction or, yeah. or we haven't neglected our health because that was an area of our life that we, we empowered. We're not going to be stressed out about this tax bill that's come in because we've empowered the financial area where there's some discipline and organization there with our finances. Man, if there's one thing that I think artists need out there, it's finance savviness. We, we need some financial knowledge, I think. And, and I, I haven't quite got that demon whipped, but it, it's, it's something that I think about constantly, you know? I don't. Mm-hmm. I don't know. How, how do you? How do you feel? Because sometimes pe- people get a little bit worried or, or li- feel a little bit dirty when when we start talking about money and art. And it's like, <laughs> how dare I charge that? How dare I ask for a, some sort of financial return on on what I'm creating? Because I should just be doing this for free because I love it, right? Mm, yeah, I actually went down that rabbit hole like 2000. 2000- nine ten when i don't know if you know about like the zeitgeist movies when they first came out a lot of that kind of stuff thinking about you know we've got to destroy well not destroy but you know everything has got to change completely and i was just listening to that kind of stuff constantly um you know a post-monetary world and all that kind of stuff so it's funny that that also correlated with me not being very good with money at the time i mean i was never bad um i think the key to me having any kind of artistic success or having the time to make art has also been to not incur a lot of extra expenses and that's just like i feel so distracted and motivated to make art that i don't care about wanting to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a fancy vehicle or something or uh, some crazy vacation or something like that or any kind of status things i just don't i just don't care about that like i feel i barely scratched the surface what with getting out the ideas that are in my mind. So that is an, a plenty of distraction and plenty of a, like a vacation to me would be some other kind of creative uh, wonderland, like where I could just like, it's like, you're not allowed to paint. You're not allowed to draw. All you're allowed to do is play with Lego. And there's like a million dollars worth of Lego in this room. And that's all you're allowed to do. That would be really cool to me. Like that would be because you know it's like all you can do is be creative like that that's my idea of a vacation away from painting or something like it's i don't feel that there's ever an end to that um but in terms of finances like i uh, my t- time in my life where i started to become i would say better with finances but just more mindful of needing to take care of myself better um i think that correlated with my general views on things you know and at the time where i was like you know everything is terrible and we got to have this post-monetary world and um you know just looking at a lot of views i don't want to talk about politics but um i mean i i would but i don't also i wouldn't bring that up but i'm i think all of that totally correlates right And, and my views like six or seven or eight years ago were predictably what you would line up with somebody that didn't have uh, you know, money to drop on a, a flight or something or dental work if suddenly you need it, right? Whereas once you get a little bit better with that and start to take care of that, it's like, yeah, if, there, if I had to fly, you know, death in the family or something like that, if I had to buy a, a plane ticket right away, um, I could, or if I need dental work, I could get it, you know? And I think that my views now um, are part of the reason why I'm able to take care of that, but it's still... A still a very small portion of my total thinking. Most of my thinking goes towards art, which is where I want it to go. And coming back to actually what you're saying about Martini, I think it was. D. Martini, um, yeah. D. Martini, yeah, I did listen to part of that podcast and I, I really like that kind of thing. Like I, I mm. think that's so precious. And the, the idea of like um, having, you know, seven different areas or something. Um, for me, I, I guess I always felt like there was still kind of a, like, I don't, know how I'm deviating from what he said in any way. It's just my own thing, but it's like this idea that, um, you know, if our, our human experience is like a tree and there's branches and leaves. And those are the details that I think most of us get caught up in on a regular basis. And then there's the larger branches and the trunk of the tree, um, which is generally considered, you know, fairly deep thinking. And then there's the roots below that, which is even deeper. And I think to me, 
the trunk of the tree is is like actually our health, like our personal health, because if we don't have physical energy, we can't do things and mental energy. We don't think about it as much. I think physical fitness, we think about the ability to lift weights and all that kind of stuff or yeah. move around. But yeah. caloric, the caloric energy that it takes to to push ourselves and motivate ourselves and to do other things, it's all in the brain. Like it really starts yeah. with with having mental energy and that decision making. And that ties to physical health. That ties to diet. Absolutely. I would say because we can't control so much in the world. Like I can't control all the larger stuff that's going on around me. If there's a terrible natural disaster or somebody else does something to me, I can't control any of that. We are so powerless in so many ways, but of what we can control, which would be like my physical health, for example, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to control what goes into my mouth and, and the amount of times that I exercise and get cardiovascular things going on because I can control that. And for, for me, like I've had a lot of ideas even like when i'm on a, a treadmill or something or um not a treadmill but like the elliptical things at the gym and stuff like that i've ha sometimes had these like strange like surges of like energy where i'm just feeling like you know why isn't everybody doing this like this kind of feeling like you don't know what you're missing like this is yeah. so refreshing <laughs> it's like to to sweat out your pores and like yeah it's it's like another plane of existence almost it's yeah. like a it's like a the frequency right it's like a higher frequency living on that frequency where you're That's physically good. healthy and doing that on a regular basis and when we're in that other frequency it's like it's like kind of like we're blinded like half of everything is kind of constantly not there and then we tend to blame the rest of the world for that blindness that happens is like it's it's not my fault it's that tree that's in the way or that pillar that's in the way it's not my mm. fault the way i'm looking at things mm. right it, well yeah absolutely i i, <laughs> I sometimes want to get yeah you know, i get a bit of evangelical about the exercise side of things um you know went through a few health things last year and i stopped training for a while but now i'm well and truly back into it and i i quite often when I'm in there working out, I'm the only one in the gym. Now, granted, there's only 500 people in my town, but surely <laughs> one person could could come and, and join me in that gym. And fortunately, quite a lot of the time it's it's Rachel, but there's there's a few times where it'll just, yeah, it'll just be me. And I'm like, how can I be the only one? You know, it's it's like, come on guys, this is, and, and for me again, you know, just to drive that point home, physical exercise and physical well-being again is probably the, probably been one of the best things for my creativity in my career and just generating ideas because when I'm engaged in something else that's not creative, like it's, it's almost like it's, it's making this fertile field and then suddenly this idea just comes crashing out of the ground and it's like, oh, wow, there's an idea in there that I can harvest. I can just, I could go and draw that in the sketchbook or I can put that on canvas, you know, that's, yeah. or, or it might be, or it might be something that I've struggled with at the easel, like the way, the way, you know, this snowy scene, it's just got too much, you know, white going on. How can I do something a little bit more interesting with the shadows or something like that? And there'll be, I'll find the solution while I'm deadlifting and I'll be like, oh, oh, that, oh, that's what I do. Oh, okay, cool. And, you know, you go back, you work on it. It's great. I, I, I just can't, I can't stress that enough. I think it's, I think it's, it's such a valuable thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds unrelated, right? I think, I mean, if, if anyone's listening to this and they're thinking like, what does that have to do with art? I think then that's a clue that they might have to, well, this is the thing, know, that's the man. advice that you need, right? That's like the, yeah. it's like a Carl Jung quote on something about the, the advice that we need the most is the advice that we least want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It, but uh, no, it, and again, you know, people might think, yeah, okay, well, it's it, this is not art related. It's got nothing to. What do my finances have to do with art? Um, again, we we want to try and and create a life. I mean, because it, it's not necessarily just about the art. It's about the artist. If you mm -hmm. don't, if you're, if you as a person, as the creator, aren't a hundred percent, you're holding yourself back. And again, as as exciting as this time is as much opportunity as we have at our fingertips, you're not going to be in a position to take advantage of them because, you know, oh, I can't go to the thing because I can't afford to, or I can't do that because, you know, this is going on in my life or I have to deal with this, you know, and it, it's, you know, this is about just do again, we're not going to keep ourselves from misfortune. That's, that's just a reality of life, but we can do the best we can to make ourselves as a, a the, the whole being, you know, 
and yeah. we're more resilient than to what life is going to throw at us because it's going to throw something. It's going to throw something. Yeah. But again, look, I, 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 we're jumping all over the place, but again, I love it. Whatever. There was something about, you know, Peter Joseph and the Zeitgeist movies. And <laughs> I, around the same time, I started uh, really um, getting into that sort of thing and then getting into the alternative media and what the news wasn't telling you. And, and here's who is really behind that big event that we all remember. And, and I, I, every conspiracy theory you could name, I would probably be able to tell you a little something about it. You know, mm -hmm. and I became that guy at the party that no one wanted to talk to, you know, because it's just like, he's like, oh, Tish is over there. He's talking about fluoride again. Damn it. <laughs> Who invited this guy? You know, I don't Chemtrails. get it. I, I, man, I don't get invited to a lot of parties anymore. Maybe that's why. But <laughs> a town of 500 people. <laughs> that's it. That's it. And I'm the weird one. No, yeah. but I, I, um, the the conspiracy theories and feeling like I needed to know about that stuff, that was huge to let go of, massive, and even as I I hear myself saying that now, um, I feel like well no there's still some stuff that you absolutely must know about because that's informed your decision making okay sure, but again I think it's about knowing what I can control as an individual and what's out of my control, and again yeah. allowing myself to get stressed out fearful about the future again takes that blood flow away from the frontal cortex of my brain starts driving me back down into the re reptilian brain and i'm creating crap work i'm not mm -hmm. drawing my best i'm not paying i'm not sleeping right i'm not eating right like it is, it's just affecting everything so again feeding your mind and choosing what goes into that it, it was vital for me as well so you know i got that audible app you know, as soon as I found out about it, first thing I heard, I was like, I can listen to audiobooks on my phone. And I just got lists of books now. I've just got a whole row of books and even some that I haven't gotten to yet. But it's artist biographies. There's a great one I've just been listening to on Leonardo da Vinci. Fantastic mm. book. It's like 15, 17 hours long, but it's it's been wonderful. Um, mm. You know, even my old favorites, I like checking back in with, with D. Martini, but also Napoleon Hill and Tony Robbins. And then a lot of it's business and mindset stuff. But I thought, no, no, I, no more negativity, no more conspiracy theories, no more into the world stuff, no more Elon Musk is going to create the next AI robot that's going to eat our lunch for us. No more of that stuff. This is all about, you know, we, we where can I take my business? Because all I can control is what I have in front of me and right now and making the most of this situation that's, that's yeah. here in front of me. And by God, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think logically we can just use our own thought experiment and sit down and think, you know, I'm here. And if we have a scope of history, we know that there our ability to do this right now and the knowledge that I'll probably live, you know, hopefully live longer than the average person did a few hundred years ago. That's, that's a victory. That's, that's huge. You know, I, I see the work that Raphael and, you know, Da Vinci and all those people created with the limitations that they had. And, I have the ability to go in Photoshop and isolate a color <laughs> and see, you know, wow, that's actually warmer than I thought and, and a lighter value than I thought too. Wow, that's a surprise. You know, they didn't have the technology to help them do that. And uh, so it's kind of like, yeah, the no excuses thing now. But still we get into, uh, I don't want to like get off into this other dimension, but um, the idea of competition because then we have like well if i have the ability to go on photoshop and do that then so do millions of other people and then you go on instagram and there's millions of people doing incredible stuff and it's like to me I, i've always i think in the last couple of years especially with instagram especially once i got more uh serious about it and actually trying to post uh i shouldn't say anything right now because i haven't posted for like a month or more but um i will <laughs> currently creating stuff that i will but um the, the main difference there for me is uh, th feeling like subject matter versus uh, technique. So if, if a person wants to get intimidated or jealous of somebody else's technique, there's a million places where you can look. But the real sort of like creative real estate that I would not get jealous about is my own world. And I don't have to 
you know, because I can look at somebody else's stuff and says, oh, that's really, that's a really great technique. Maybe I can apply it to my world. And so there's no, um, there's no feeling of competition there because it's kind of like, you know, you eventually develop that place where you feel, um, I'm going to say there's, there's a word I, I won't say it on the podcast, but, um, you know, like an, un, un, uh, what's untouchable, <laughs> uh, where you can't not that, that sounds a little self aggrandizing, but where you feel like you're the idiosyncr- idiosyncrasies of your thing are unique enough to you that you don't have to worry about somebody else accidentally stealing that. And then all of a sudden feeling like, Hey, I was doing that. Like, you know, suddenly I can't paint those anymore. I should, you know, copyright that idea that I had. Right. That's, that's a really silly thing of power to control that. A hundred percent. I, just on the competition front, I, I avoid competitions like the plague. I will not anymore. As long as I live enter a competition that is judged by, mm. you know, let's say, a, a, an expert or, or somebody who feels like they have the accreditation to be able to cast judgment on the work and dictate to other people what's good or what's not good. I think it does some pretty, I mean, it, look, it, it does have some benefits and people do get a lot out of it. I don't want to just write that off. But for me personally, it takes me so far away from what feels authentic because I feel like personally, I'm not able to control that. I, I start doing the work for the wrong reason. And then I, I've got an outcome attached to the work. It's no longer me lost in my creative pursuit. It's, it's just no. I'm going to do this, and and hopefully something will happen. Oh, oh well, try again next year, you know. Yeah. Um. I, I think there's room for everybody. I think anybody that's really genuinely and authentically creating has already won in in a certain respect, and. That's the only thing that matters, you know, getting down to competition and jealousy because we're faced with so much with social media. It used to be brutal, man. Like back in the day when I first started out on Facebook and and even Instagram, I was looking at other artists. I would get so jealous, so jealous because I'd be like, first, look how many followers they have. You know, I'm okay. (laughs) Where are all my followers? I'd post a picture. How come it's not viral? You know, and it's just just silly crap. And then then I would I would start comparing myself to, to other people. Mm-hmm. And it, look, if, if I'm honest, it took me a while to to get around that and go, that is not what it's about. That is not what it's about. Because again, while I'm worried about something and while that's stressing me out, I'm not thinking about what I could do. What do I have in me? What do I really want to say anyway? And, yeah. and the thing that I, I then became obsessed with was, okay, first of all, shut up. What makes you tick creatively? Let's, do, let's drill into that. And it was a question of, oh, I love the way the, the way the light shines off that mountain. Okay, we'll go and paint that. And I'm talking to myself in this situation. Go and paint that and do the best job you can. And who cares who's done it before? Who cares who's doing it now and posting on Instagram? You reflect on your personal experience, do the best you can with the subject that inspires you, and you're gonna end up creating something unique. That's the amazing thing. But the thing I realized is that that wasn't something I could measure. If I was chasing originality, and if I was chasing something that was unique, it had the opposite effect because then I, again, I'm focused on what everybody else is doing and tweaking my approach instead of going inside and going, no, no, no. What do you love? Well, I love to paint giant portraits of celebrities that have been and gone and I want to do it in bright rainbow colors. Great. Well, go and do that. Who cares if people have painted Jimi Hendrix? Go and do it and make a damn fine job of it. Do the best you can because what's going to end up happening is that as you're pouring that love out of you, it's going to end up taking on its unique flair. And then pretty soon people are going to go, holy crap, look at what this guy's doing. Look what this gal's doing. This is unique. This is incredible. And then mm-hmm. it starts building. But then again, don't focus on the building. Don't just keep going back to the work and checking back in. And when I look at your work and I look at your, you know, your Instagram and your website, I, I just see something there that is absolutely authentic. Again, I, I said it before, but I, I love what you're doing, man. I mean, it's it's slick. I mean, not only is it you know exceptionally well done, I just look at it and go, wow, I haven't I haven't really seen that before. 
I, I can't say Steve Schmiller is like so and so. You you mm. seem to have hit your stride in, in a really unique way. Thank you. Um I guess what well, coming back to the idea of competition in a way we're always we're just in a competition with ourselves to be as much ourself as we can to be more specific at that special unique thing that that little idea that makes me feel like it's my own thing to get to zone in on that more and more and more and more and um you know, the, the other interesting thing, I, I mean, I've noticed, I've, I've seen other painters and other paintings that do remind me of my work a little bit. And sometimes I do feel a little bit of that feeling, that jealousy feeling once in a while as well. But um, as I zone in more and more on, on my thing, I feel like the reason that it comes across that way is because I'm always chasing like I just just said, my certain flavor of of whatever that mood was that I was trying to create when I first made that tiny little sketch or something that's unique to me that doesn't involve the rest of the world. And there's, I mean, maybe there's a thought I have about that that would be a little bit controversial. Like I know there's an idea that artists should you know, like when I first moved to the big city, people would say, oh, you're going to move to the big city so you can be inspired by other artists and share ideas and all this kind of stuff. And even before I moved, I was saying in my head, like, no, I'm I'm not going there to look at what somebody else did and then say, oh, I want to do that now, too. Like, it was never the point, like, or to be inspired by anything that I saw. Like, I was never painting what I saw. Like, my my thing that I was going for was always was always different than that. So eventually it came to the point where I realized that um, what I was going for was an internal thing. And it was taking that internal thing and being able to convert it into the actual physical painting most accurately without any sort of weird translation issues in between in that process. And I'm still going for that. Um, but, you know, there's also the knowledge that there's nothing new under the sun and and so of course there's going to be other stuff that's sort of similar in some ways. Um, but it was, it was never about, Oh, I mean, naturally was always irreverent to trends. Like I, from a young age, I'm really lucky that I had the experience with music because I always felt that way ever since I was like 14, 15, 16 years old writing songs. I always felt that I was, uh, originality was important to me. Like I always had the feeling that that was one of the cornerstone things to, to this whole thing. It's like, you know, technique is over here. Um, you know, emotional expression and the performance is over here. Originality is here. Um, subject matter and how it relates to my time period is over here. Like there's all those things that are super important and I want to try to hit all of them. And what is the one or two areas that I'm weakest at right now? And that's what I'm going to focus on. So I was always thinking about that and I got, I got to warm up with that whole idea about original creation in, in making three full length albums and, uh, thinking like when I'm writing this song, am I thinking about it from somewhat through someone else's ears or how I, how I think someone else hears it or sees it. And I got to warm up with that so much, like a little story that would hopefully relate that or make it seem clear is like, I know there's psychological tests about like children being able to predict what other people know. So, for example, at a certain age, I don't know whether it's like two or something like that, children don't know what other people know. So if you hide something from them and then reveal it, they don't know that the other person that just walked into the room doesn't know what's in that box because they don't know what they know. Like we don't have that. It's something of mind or something like that theory. of I'm not exactly sure. But we, we're always doing that as artists. We're always thinking like, how does this relate? You know, how does this piece of subject matter feel to me and how do I know that other people would probably see this and so we're sort of predicting how what we're making will be translated through other people's perceptions which you can never know except for what they say to you maybe or what you think they're thinking inside that they didn't say to you right there's all this meta stuff going on at the same time and so going back to my music days we started making a living playing music in like 2002 2003 when we played a lot of cover gigs right so we're the band at the bar that's uh you know everybody's going out drinking and uh we had a really cool gig in calgary 
at this place called Cayley's, which was, um, I'm sure there's a Cayley's in almost every big city probably. Uh, it was the industry night, right? So that's the night when, uh, when all the people and all the, you know, cute girls that work in other places, that's their night off. So, you know, we were really lucky to get that gig when it was at its peak. And so there was like this, it was almost like New Year's Eve every Monday night. Like there was tons of people and you got like this, you know, you're the center of attention and I'm the lead singer in front of all these people. And I got these, got to feel that, that feeling of sort of being like a local rock star for a certain period of time. And what we found was that there was a lot of bands in the same city playing a lot of the same songs. And we wanted to be different, but we also wanted to play the songs that people knew. So it's like, okay, how do we please, like our job is to please these people and make them dance and have a good night. How do I predict what they want to hear? Well, you know, if we have friends and you talk to people and you know, whatever's popular at the time and it's pretty obvious, but what we eventually thought was me and my friend Tyler, we we were both like, let's play the songs that people know, but th that they don't know that they love or they don't remember that they want to hear so badly. You know, the songs that are sort of unsung, let's play those songs. So we intentionally learned, we filled our set list mostly with songs that no, no other cover bands played. Like um, at the time, like, uh, you know, bringing back songs that were like 10 years or 15 years old at the time already, like, um, uh, presidency, United States of America played like this, uh, millions of peaches, you know, so songs like that or whatever, like that was really popular. Everybody knew it, but we had never heard any other local cover bands playing that song. So when we played it, it was, it just went off like nuts. Like people went crazy because we were able to sort of deliver something that is like, yeah, I know I want that. I know I need that, but I don't, I don't know. You know, they didn't play it themselves. We played it. Um, so going ahead into the future, I kind of feel like it's the same thing. Like as artists, we're always, we're always trying to tap into that thing that everybody can relate to, but they haven't seen yet. And that's like, that's our job. Our job isn't to see a trend that's happening and say, Oh, so people are doing this now. So, so I got to do that so I can be accepted in that crowd. You know, there's always these trends that seem to have like a five year span going on right now. Right? Like there's, um, you know, there was, when I first moved to Toronto, there was, there was this like animal head on people, human bodies and stuff like that was like a really big thing there for a little while. And there was a couple people that sort of did it first and credit to them. Right. But then they get lost in the shuffle with all the other people that are starting to do it because it's a, it's, that's what you got to do. And then at a certain point, like neon was really came back, right? Like the late eighties, early nineties, obviously is when it kind of started. And then there was this neon trend for a little while and, and then drips like neon drips. So whatever the subject matter is plus neon drips, good to go accepted. Right. To me, that was always like, why would you do something because it's in style? Like that's the opposite of what we're going for as artists. Like we're, it's our job to venture out and say, Hey, look at this. And if everyone says, no, that's not good, then it's like, well, at least I tried, at least I experimented with something different and tried to show it to, to people in a different way. And that's, that's our job as artists is to experiment. And if we, you know, experiment 10 times and only hit it one time out of 10, that was valuable. That was incredibly valuable. That's, that's what we need to be comfortable with is, is missing and, and not getting too down on ourselves for not hitting the target every time. I don't know if you can, I'm sure you can relate to that, but that's, you know, generally how I feel about, about that and the experience that I learned through playing music to, um, to making art and to where I'm still going now. It's like zoning in on that one thing that is mine and not caring about everything else. No, I think, I think that's wonderful as well. Um, I, I get, yeah, no, I, I could, I can totally relate, Steve. Absolutely. And, you know, in, in a couple of different ways, because, because of the position that I find myself in now, relatively large social media following and YouTube channel and, and website, email list, all that stuff. I, I'm getting questions constantly. And one of the ones that I get quite a lot, you know, people want to have some feedback on their work. And a lot of the younger people, the younger up, up and coming people, there's a lot of, you know, pencil and colored pencil and pastel and, and that's fine. But <clears throat> I look at their work and it's Joaquin Phoenix as the Joker mm -hmm. or Deadpool or here's yeah. a a portrait of of uh, Brad Pitt or whoever is the and I'm really going to date myself, but who, whoever is the actual you know popular actor of the time, 
you know, and, and or, or pop star. And it's it, people are really, really inspired by and, and just really taken with trying to get that to look as real as possible. And here's Tony Stark drawn as real as possible. And that's OK. Yeah. That's fine. But at the end of the day, you know, a lot of people are as well. They're asking, you know, how can I want to paint something epic? Where can I find that epic thing? And I think mm-hmm. this is, a, again, I mean, that's the role of artists, as we're saying, is to to dig down and find the epic within and and try and figure out, OK, if, if everybody else is doing it, OK, well, maybe there's something there, but probably not. It's by the time you see it everywhere, it is over. It's mm-hmm. done. It's put a fork in it. It is done. I don't know how many more big portraits of people with honey, oil, milk, or whatever <laughs> dripping down their heads. How many more of those I can see? You know, yeah. that that's, that's, there's, they're everywhere. You know, they're absolutely everywhere. There's a few people who are probably the first. I reckon my buddy, um, uh, Matt Doust, you know, when, when he was still alive and he was still painting, I reckon he was the first one. I'm just going to say it, but I probably, I could be wrong, but that was the first time I ever saw that. I was like, wow, dude, that's really neat. And since then I see huge portraits of stuff. So, um, I, yeah. I, I think, um, yeah, it, it, it's about just, again, finding the epic, epic within the, the portraits, you know, the, there's some of my favorite portraits. Mm-hmm weren't of anybody famous, no celebrity or anything. For me, when it, just speaking personally about the work that I've done, my favorite portraits are the one, the people that didn't ask for it, the people that I saw something in them. No one knew who these people were. My favorite two were Oma and Granddad, my, my wife's grandparents. And these are kiwi fruit farmers from the North Island of New Zealand. And just humble, simple people. But there was such a grace and a beauty in them. And I was like, I want to talk about that. Those are probably two of my most viewed videos on YouTube. There's, there's, mm-hmm. nothing, there's nothing about, you know, fame or, or anything. It was just like, how can I paint these people with love? And hopefully that comes through. And I think it did come through for a lot of people. But I yeah. guess the point I'm trying to make is, again, coming back to maybe, maybe not worrying so much about how you can put your own unique spin on the neon drips. But how how can you just do whatever the hell you want to do, even if it is Tony Stark, if that's really what you would love to do, mm-hmm. do it. Do one hell of a job at it, too. But mm-hmm. sometimes the answer, the epic, the ma- majestic, the magnificent is just sitting right in front of us, you know, just mm-hmm. just within our reach. And no one knows about it. And it's our job to say, hey, I always felt that this was the job of the artist. Look at this isn't this cool? You know, isn't this an amazing thing? Um, there's a documentary that I love uh, by Roger Scruton called Why mm. Beauty Matters. And it's still yeah. on YouTube, I'm pretty sure. Have you seen it? Yeah, I do. A, a while ago, yeah. So there, he was talking about a painting. And I think it was Corbet who, who did this painting of crumpled bed sheets, And and it was, Roger Scruton was talking about, you know, all of these different layered meanings that could come from this this painting of crumpled bed sheets. My takeaway, my thought process was, this guy wasn't looking to be groundbreaking or anything. He just saw something. He was like, "Wow, that's amazing! I got to paint that," and it created a masterpiece that we talk about still over a hundred years later. You know, mm-hmm. and and so I think yeah, the epic is just within reach. It's just a matter of just reaching out and grabbing it yeah i guess it's that idea of making something that not everyone is noticing and and putting it on a pedestal and saying uh you know this is something we see every day like leaves i just recently created a leaf study for a beginner oil painting class that i'm doing and it's like all i can see outside right now is fallen leaves like they're all over the place we all see them every day right now here um so what's so special about that? Well, let me tell you, right? So it's like, (laughs) look at it this way. And, and suddenly we'll see that. Yeah. But it's, I think it's the, what you're talking about with your portrait of the grandparents as well. That's because everyone else in the world doesn't know who they are. It's, it's suddenly, um, uh, looking at their, the personal character, like the emotion, that that they're having or what it is about them that is universal or something like that rather than look at this famous person 
you know, I'm painting this because I want to be associated with this famous person or something like, I don't know, we all do it, right? Like there's this name dropping or something like we'll, if sometimes if you've been to a certain place or whatever, you make sure that you mention that or if you know a certain person, um, you know, like there's this tendency in the arts to sort of look for popularity or celebrity that way. Whereas uh, like I personally always felt like rather than moving to like New York city or something like that so that I can then be associated with New York, I would rather move to the middle of nowhere and make that special so that suddenly people say that that's special because so-and-so lives there. I don't know. That sounds a little bit self-aggrandizing, but I kind of feel like, um, there's definitely something to that. Like it's, um, I don't live in the middle of nowhere, but I think you live in the middle of nowhere more than I do, but, um, it's definitely not, uh, this is not, this is not Toronto. <laughs> no, I'm definitely in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that going, yeah, yeah, actually that's, that's pretty much what I did in a nutshell. Um, you know, again, Lawrence in the middle of this, or at the bottom of the South Island of New Zealand, you know, a little town on the, on a highway between two, two kind of major centers, if you can call them that Dunedin has 50,000 people, they call it a city. Uh, and Queenstown has anywhere between 50,000 to three and a half million, depending on what time of year you go. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's nuts, but we're, we're just tucked away and we're the little town that you zoom through. Maybe you stop off, go to the bathroom, get an ice cream, keep going. Maybe get some gas, keep going. Yeah. And, um, when I, they, they found, I was saying to, to Rachel about this, you know, when we first moved here, cause she was asking me, she was, we, we were going, is this something we really want to do? Is this a move we really want to make? And they, they had, they had found gold here back in the 1860s and it was a huge gold mining town, massive gold rush. So, you know, far from the, the 500 people that are here today, it had like 11,000 back in the day. It was like a big deal. It was one of the richest gold mine uh, finds on the planet at the time. It was, it was huge. Wow. So it rivaled anything that was found in Alaska, in the United States, in Australia. This was a massive deposit. And so it was booming. There was there was activity everywhere. And then, of course, the seams, they dry up and people shift and they move. And now we're left with some relics from a really interesting past. And as we're coming through, I was saying to Rachel, I, I thought it sounded cool, but I was like, no, there's still gold here. It's just a different kind of gold. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should put, put that on a T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not? Lawrence, there's still gold here. Actually, yeah. that's a good idea. That's a good idea. But I, I, I believe that. I believe that, 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 you know, opportunity is where you find it. And, and it, it's, it's sometimes just right in front of you. you yep. Know? Well, I think you're living proof of that to be able to have the reach that you've had, you know, with the help of the internet, obviously, and your use of that tool so effectively yeah. to be able to be where you are and be having the success that I'm sure you've had. And I know people that are currently living in Toronto, for example, that have endless resources, uh, maybe a lack of space, because I mean, that's the one thing about the big city is that space is more expensive. And that's yeah. part of why I like being where I am right now. Yeah. But it's not uh, it's not a matter of of the external. It's a matter of the internal. Right. It's like, yes, your internal is always there no matter where you are. Yes. And I've, I mean, that's why I've, I've always painted rough, relatively the same thing regardless of where I've lived over the last eight years or nine years, I've always had one vision in mind no matter where I am because it's coming from inside rather than, Oh, I saw that. Now I see that looks good. Okay. Now I'm going to do that. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But uh, again, I mean, just my, my own personal trajectory. I mean, before anybody knew about me on YouTube or online, I mean, it might've seemed like I came out of nowhere, but I was already a professional artist for over a decade before, mm. you know, full time since I was 21, before anybody ever knew that I, you know, oh, here he is on YouTube, you know, and then then I show up at the time, I, I was a lot bigger than long hair and I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna teach you how to paint a picture. But but now it's, um, 
I, what I realized is just the power of the medium of, of the internet that we have. We could be anywhere. I'm waiting for another artist or two artists. I'm telling you right now, let me just put a, put a little announcement out there. There are some beautiful old buildings available in Lawrence. You can get yourself a cheap house and a big old building. Come have a studio gallery in this town. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go off soon, but I, I, I'm fully in. I'm just waiting for another artist to go, hang on. This looks pretty cool. We could do this, you know. Maybe somebody will will take me up on it. <laughs> well, I like the idea that the world is is a little more spread out. You know, there's a lot yeah. of dots on the map, and yeah. I don't think everything always has to gravitate just to that one dot. You know, oh that no, one it has to. Dot. It yeah. has to here. This is the, I want to create. <laughs> I want to create an art mecca. It needs to be yeah, more. Well, Lawrence, <laughs> give, yeah, you're making that that tiny dot bigger. Yeah, but I, I think in general, it's the the idea that we have to go to. A certain place in order to become successful or something and I, I love that about what we can do with in visual arts with the internet now and to be you know uh reach out to collectors at any time you know that's crazy like i don't know a lot of people didn't see that coming i don't think absolutely steve we, we were talking about this earlier on in the um in the conversation, just about the business side of things i want to touch back on some of those aspects that we're talking about Again, you gave us a, a bit of a snapshot into the way it works now. But, but I'm just curious, seeing as we've been talking about the online model and the opportunities that are, that are kind of available to us as artists now, how do you find yourself kind of deriving an income, if you don't mind me asking? Do you work with galleries or do you work mainly for private clients that you find online or that find you? How does, this, how does that split work? And you know, give, give me an idea of, of, of how you operate and survive as a creative professional. Um, I've been, in, I would say, 95% independent um, since I started. And that was all kind of inadvertent. You know, I, I didn't know what I was doing when I first did my first public shows, just outdoor fairs and things like that. And the idea of the email list was new to me at the time. And... Um, so I just I just kept that and realized that, you know, there were some people interested in buying work um, privately and that made perfect sense to me. So right from the beginning, I, I always had this idea that, you know, there was a way things are supposed to be and the way, th you know, there's a path you're supposed to go down. Right. Um, and there's all these books you can buy, you know, how to make it as an artist and this kind of stuff. I've never read any of those books and I don't. I don't say that to sort of prop myself up. I'm sure there's a lot of information I could get from something, but um, I think my definition of success at the time was to go down the same path that I knew to go down, which is to get represented by the biggest gallery that you can that has the best clients and and then you'll be a real artist and that kind of a thing. And now I, it's not that way at all. Um, I think when, it, when I started like 2000, well, 2009 was my first outdoor public show, but just a it was an outdoor fair, right? It wasn't even like a prestigious show by any means. Um, but uh, at that time, people would still say like, "Oh, what? You know, you're an artist. Oh, okay. What gallery are you represented by?" And I would say, "Oh, I'm not. I'm not represented by a gallery." And they would automatically assume that you're not very serious, or you're not established at all, or your work's not very good. So, but it seems like just within the last three or four years, even that's changed to the point where the caliber of artists that are totally independent has gone up so much more that that perception is changing. And I think it might take another decade or two or three or four to, to where that's completely changed. But I've always been so inspired by people that are pretty much independent who are, you know, making a decent living. And, um, so my definition of success has changed. And I think that's the point I need to go back to. I think at, at some point, you know, when you're young, you have very naive ideas about like, oh, I'm going to be super rich one day and all this kind of stuff, of course, right? Um, but at the time, I think I needed that sort of certification, that external sort of like stamp of approval from somebody being repped by a huge gallery, doing a massive solo show that kind of always felt to me like, like um, graduation does to a lot of young kids or like high school kids, right? It's like, oh, there's that one special day or like, 
a, a wedding day or something, right? It's like that one special day. And I always kind of felt like that's going to be in the future sometime, like a one solo show where I can, it's going to be so important that all my family members are going to come. It's going to be worth them flying all the way across the country to come and see, because it's going to be so important. There's that one defining moment. And that has not happened at all. I have not had one defining moment in my career. It's been super gradual. It has been um, so gradual that it's motivating, though, because it always feels like things are constantly going up. And I've never looked for that one huge peak to the point where it feels like, okay, now I've done everything I can do. Now it's all downhill from here. Like it, I've never felt like that. I always feel like things are still going up. So um, basically, I think I've been able to accept that because my definition of success has changed. I'm no longer looking for certification from somebody else or having won a certain prize or something like that or being repped by a certain gallery or being on the cover of a certain magazine or something though that would be really nice um it's basically just making a living that's like if i can paint every day and afford to buy some materials to make a sculpture or something to use as a reference for a painting or whatever it may be as long as I can afford to do all that, then that's success. That to me is total success. So I feel as of right now, I'm successful. Um, and if my paintings eventually, you know, gain in price a bit, then that's even just better, right? So it's kind of like icing on the cake. It's a great answer. I love that. I love that. Uh, I, again, I had, um, <laughs> I've always had that goal for myself and that definition of success, that success was sustaining creative production the job of the artist is to continually make art and if you can do that then pat yourself on the back you're successful and that the, all, all this other stuff is just extra you know it's it's about can we can we live a creative life can we pay the bills and can we derive that income solely from our from our creative production and again if, if we can't there's no harm as well if there are people out there listening to this there's no shame or, or anything in, in having to work part time or doing something yeah. to supplement that creative production. But you could still, I guess, consider yourself a full time artist if you are dedicating a full time amount of time, which is like a 40 hour yeah. work week to painting. I mean, if you can yeah. do that, that is a hell of an achievement and it's something to be insanely proud of. So I hope that people out there could, can hear that again. Yeah, it's not, it's not about it's not about going for the big kill, is it? Or, or having the, the next big thing and the next feather in your hat. It's about coming back to the simple side of things. And what am I going to paint today? Yeah, I guess that also links to how we define what or who an artist is, because mm -hmm. they're personally for me, it's basically somebody that dedicates as much time as they can mm. to putting forth their original vision regardless of whether they're working other jobs and stuff. And I mean, I'm, I pat anybody on the back that is able to, um, you know, have, uh, have kids or, or, you know, other jobs and things like that. And also make great stuff. Like that's yeah. huge. That's massive. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Yeah. It's challenging for me. And I, I've set up my life in a way that I, I can pretty much paint every day, all day if I want to. And it's still challenging. So hats off to <laughs> yeah, you know absolutely yeah. so i i'm again this this little goat in the background uh steve has been um staring at me and i i um i i kind of want to know a little bit more about it but i guess i guess the question is you know i i find your paintings just so so damn intriguing and so they're so they're so interesting not only well executed but so interesting how do you come up with the ideas you come up with and what are what really drives you what are some of the themes and things that interest you personally when you approach the canvas i think in terms of subject matter it's the big questions right that we could obviously talk about for an infinite amount of time um specific like you know all the big stuff right um which is not something that I know a lot of people that are critical of representational painting and would say that's in the past and move beyond that. Like, I think that's one of the things that, that, um, people stray away from and that end of the philosophical spectrum is like, don't talk about the big questions or anything like that. Right. It's like, whereas to me, that's always been the most interesting thing. It's just how it's 
put on the table, so to speak. Um, that being said, this animal is on a table. <laughs> um, it's kind of like an idea of, of like, um, like visual metaphors, um, something that really means a lot to me, like a certain certain subject matter or like even a key phrase, even just words. And then that kind of translates into, okay, I got to sketch some little thumbnail sketches and try to lay this out. So it's usually always a, a topic. There's always something. And then that something turns into visuals, which sometimes in the end almost doesn't have very much to do with the initial inspiration or the little notes that I wrote down, but that's what it ends up as. It has to be, I mean, it's funny that you, that you said, I'm really glad that you said you find the work intriguing. Cause that's, that's what I'm going for. I, I, I find like if I do an art fair and I have people that come into my booth or something and they, they look kind of confused. That's good. That's, that's what I'm, I think there's an art to that. There's an art to drawing people in and if you like, if I feel like if I show them something that they know exactly what it is, then they might look at it for a few seconds and be like, Oh, cool. Yeah. That's a really great, whatever it is. Um, but I want to, I want to, it's like a recipe. It's like tweaking the dials of like a, like a, of a big mixing soundboard. That's got like hundreds and hundreds of dials. Like it's a very, I try to calculate everything as much as possible and tweak little things here and there in terms of choices of subject matter so that somebody might look at it and say, Oh, that's one. Of, well, no, wait a minute. That's not what I thought it was. Or, and that's this. And why is that person doing that? And, and you know, so for me, there's got to be a certain amount of, of stuff that's handed a, on a silver platter. That's like, yeah, of course this is a person. And this little part of the painting is, you know, a, a, a portrait that I put, you know, 12 hours into, and that might just be one little part of a larger painting, but, you know, so somebody can just take that from it and appreciate that. Or they can also ask, well, why are they looking at this and who's that person and why are they pointing at that or whatever? And what's that? And what's the bigger meaning behind all of it? To, to me, that's the, that's the exciting part. Um, the little animal on the table, I'll see if I can, this is, so this is a sculpture that I made only for the purpose of uh, an art reference. So it, it's really meant to be seen only from this angle. The back of it is not finished at all. Uh, it's made with um, what's it called, Sculpty clay. So the back of it is like just a piece of wood right there. You can see the, like, I think it's like balsa wood or something. And then white clay on top of it, or no, pink clay. Cause like, you know, the, a lot of animals have like a fleshy color going on underneath, underneath fur. So I just wanted to go as far as I could um, so that the light would bounce off of it and it would have three-dimensional form. And then of course, convert that into uh, the painted version, which means I'm always still gonna be changing things massively. Like I'm not a sculptor. Um, I don't know if I could make this the sculpture that's in the background that your dad made. Um, but I'm just making something that looks good enough that light bounces off it and I have a reference and then I'll take it back to my comfort zone, which is drawing. And so then I put it on the, on the board and, and, you know, extend the neck and t tweak things and all the, which is what I'm in the middle of doing right now. Um, this other, so I'll, I'll go to the extent of making these kinds of things too. Like this is a, a little fake wall with a window in it that I made as a reference just to, um, I'm kind of obsessed with understanding light. Like when I first started painting, I wanted to uh, be a wizard. Like I wanted to, <laughs> my, my ultimate vision of what, what like a real artist would be is somebody who could sit in a white room with nothing, like no references at all, white canvas and create a new reality. So you could look at this image afterwards and like, feel like there's this entire universe where you could reach and step into and every single square millimeter of that universe is like thought and planned out consciously, um, which is obviously not what a lot of modern art movements were going for. They were going for the subconscious, right? The expression of like accidental brushstrokes and stuff. And then I think Freud was interested, like even with the surrealists, he was talking about not being interested in the conscious decisions that they made when painting, but he was more interested in what's, what's going on under the surface of these people that they're not showing in their paintings, which to me is, to, that's a great way to look at it. But I, I feel like there's another 
type of art form, which is where every single square inch or millimeter or centimeter of, of the surface is a conscious decision, more or less. And there's something to that. It's dangerous, I think, too, because the more you show, you know, especially any kind of representational art, the more you show, the more you reveal about your perception of things or your miscalculation of things. Or um, So I think that's part of why it's intriguing to me. I love that. I, I, I too, would like to be a wizard. That's that's <laughs> funny. It's funny as you're saying that. I was thinking, yeah, you know, man, I th- I've had the exact same desire and 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 you know, just hope for my career is that one day, at the end, when I'm old and look just like Gandalf the Gray, I'll be able to wave my magic brush and without anything, any reference at all, and have people go, wow. There's one one kind of. Um, kind of thought experiment that i've had and and i i tried this a couple of times but i haven't been able to to do it our our brain in 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 a there's a particular center of the brain that stores faces so that when i see steve again i will go oh that pattern that is presented in front of me recognizes you know something something's triggered and i and suddenly now it goes over my conscious brain i'll go oh that's steve Okay, I see him because his eyes are just so in his mouth and his nose and everything's the same distance away. So it matches the, 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 so I've made a copy. It's now stored as a file in my brain in that particular part. Everybody has this. The one thing that I've been really interested in is, it, is there a way that I could take that part of the brain and make it conscious so that now, and I think this goes beyond photographic memory. I, th- I think it does. But I mean, that's a thing too. Absolutely. And some savants out there, some autistic savants have a way and, and, and child prodigies have a way. There, I think there's one kid in London who did this amazing, detailed, accurate, architecturally to, to the smallest detail, uh, an accurate representation of uh, from an, an aerial flight over London. That's kind of not what I'm talking about. But is there a way that I could take what was stored in that center in my brain and now draw a faithful portrait and create a brilliant likeness of you without having you in front of me on Skype. You know, if I was to do a a portrait inspired by Sandra Kopp, you know, painting over Skype, but could I do that without actually being in front of you or seeing you or seeing a representation of you? I I couldn't do it. I can't do it. And I, I find that so interesting, that idea that we could be able to veer away from our source material just yeah and, and and then just completely dial in and then create something from our and that to me that bums me out about our own human limitations my limitations let me just speak for myself my limitations as a human being i so desperately want to break free of that and 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 kind of let loose a little bit more yeah i relate to that completely because that's why i started making the sculptures it was kind of a humbling point where i was like i'm gonna start using other things to help me out here because my first like four or five paintings were were done with like fair like little references i did find google images here and there to sort of give me a hint at something but they were for the most part invented and i was always struggling because there's so much information as you know in shadows and there's just like even folds of a garment or something right like there's just so much information there in terms of value not even form like even just black and white making drawings like there's so much information there never mind color and value so um to me that's why i started making all the little models and stuff was to not only provide a really good reference that i can paint from but to can learn like i want to keep learning about light as much as possible and surprise myself and and sort of uh, think like okay i got this little model and and if i consciously think about how do i think it's going to look once the light hits it and then turn the lights on and then be like, oh, okay. You know, sometimes I was maybe kind of close or sometimes it was totally off. And it's like, there's always something to be learned by that. Mm. But I think what you're saying about the portraits is very interesting. I, th- I think that almost anybody could learn to do that if they really focus on it. Like, I don't think it, nobody can do everything, obviously. But if you specialize in portraiture, for example, I've been trying to do this lately where you have, say, like a side profile which is like, it's almost like a signature, right? Like you can pretty much do a person's side profile in one path of a pencil. And that's like a signature that everyone's is totally unique, you know? Um, and, if, and as soon as you get into the placement of the eye and stuff, it just gets that much more unique, of course. But to me, it's like, um, 
if we can memorize the formula of that signature, then we know that much more about the variations that could happen this way or that way compared to that formula of that signature. And so I think, I think it is possible. It's just not possible to do with everything or the way that, you know, light hits the side of someone's face and then therefore how will it hit the side of their garment if it's, if it's gray or if it's white or if it's green or whatever, like there's so much information there that making all these reference models and stuff, um, makes a lot of sense to me, but I also had to humble myself down from wizardry so that I could come back to earth and say like, okay, you're not a wizard. Um, and if you want to create these, these things that can be seen as some sort of some form of realism, like not definitely not photo realism, but yeah some rep representation of realism, three-dimensional spaces, then you're going to have to use these other tools and they are available. So yeah, that's why I started doing that. It's, I mean, it's awesome. It, it works and people have been doing it for, for a long time. I mean, whether it's using a photographic image as, as the catalyst for the idea or using a model. I mean, we, We've been using lenses in art for hundreds of years, well before they even had a daguerreotype like they were using in the 19th century. The, the camera, obsc uh, camera obscura or the, the camera lucida. The, I mean, these were things that were been used for, for a long, long time. So yeah. I, I, think, I think as artists, we have to be creative and a bit clever in how we, we get that idea onto the onto the canvas and, and I think it's our job. We got to use every tool at our disposal. I mean, even if it's a digital process, the thing that I try to stop myself doing, because to me, I, I still feel, I don't want to dictate this as, as a rule for anybody else, but personally, I, I, I don't project unless it's my own image. So I, if I drew something in Photoshop, again, drawing on a tablet, not importing photography, but drawing from scratch, I will then go ahead and project that onto the canvas and transfer my design up there because it's just a fast, simple, and effective way of doing it accurately. Um, yep. But, you know, I, 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 I won't be projecting a photograph onto, onto the canvas and tracing something off. So for me, it still has to pass through the filter of the brain. But as long as you're doing that, you, could, you can be, you know, using those tools to create because at the end of the day, it's about your artistic vision. How can you see yeah. that through to the end to the best of your ability? Yeah. I've used a projector too a couple of times and I found that I still had to redraw a lot of things anyways. Even like I have a digital projector that has pretty crisp, sharp lines and I still had to redraw things. So it would give me the placement of where something is, but I had like all the little lines had to be moved and erased and customized anyways. So I, at, at that point I was just like, why not just make a really loose grid of like, if I spend a lot of time making a Photoshop reference and moving things around so that they work compositionally just in a certain way, then that's important. So I want to make sure I get those things in the right place. But from there, from that very loose grid that might only be like one, two, three, four, five, six lines, you know, dividing the canvas in a few squares and, and then just so you can get things in the right place and then still drawing to me, it's really valuable because drawing is like a muscle. And if we don't do it right, I mean, as you know, as, as you know, as, I know of seeing your um, drawing sessions that you've done on your YouTube channel as well. Like that's, it's inspiring because that's, it's true. We have to draw as much as possible to get those, keep that muscle strong. Yeah. As much as we can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Steve, I've really enjoyed this conversation. We've gone in all kinds of different areas and it's just been a real blast uh, getting to know you a little bit more and hearing a little bit more about your process and your work. What's next for you uh, on this journey? What are some of the things you're working on right now? Are you putting together an exhibition? Are you working on a commission? I'm currently working on a large piece that is still in the underpainting part of the process. It's behind me. Um, and it was fortunately, that's another example of the internet. Um, it's It's sold, so I'm able to continue to work on it and then finish it. Um, the collector is in no huge rush. So that's awesome. Um, other than that, I've got tons of ideas and I've got another piece I'd like to start before this one is finished. Um, other than that, if, you know, my whole career has kind of been planning maybe a year ahead, but I don't have any major exhibitions that I'm planning right now. Um, I think in a way I've kind of gone against the grain of what you're supposed to do by 
not putting a lot of time into that, but just putting a lot of time into the content and sort of um, would use the analogy of throwing a pebble in a pond, right? And creating ripples. I've always just in my own way, create a bigger stone or a bigger pebble so that when I do throw it in the pond, it creates more ripples. And that's kind of worked for me. I found that the effort that I put into anything has been proportional. So if bigger effort, bigger results, bigger response. So being that that's worked for me in the past, that's what I continue to try to do is just make the greatest work that I possibly can dedicate every moment that I possibly can to that. And then from there, more things can happen. So that's it. Brilliant. Brilliant, man. Well, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you for being on The Creative Endeavor. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, I really hope that you've enjoyed this episode of the Creative Endeavor podcast and a huge thank you to Steve Schmiller for joining me. Now, if you want to see more of Steve's work, make sure you follow him on Instagram at Steve Schmiller. And he can also be found on his website where there are so many examples of his fantastic art. Simply go to www.steveschmiller.com. Now, if you liked this episode of The Creative Endeavor, then please hit that like button for me. Leave me a comment down below. And if you want to see more of this podcast, some of my painting tutorials, my Q&A videos, or my sketch endeavor series, then make sure you subscribe to this channel. Hit that notification icon so you're notified when I upload another video. As always, you can find me on social media, but most important, check me out on my website, www.andrewtischler.com. Thanks so much for stopping by, and I'll see you again soon.